conservation part of the studio here. Uh, let's take a look at our object of desire. Uh, a wonderful, wonderful portrait of Louis XV. Uh, yeah, he was 21 here. He was a Réjean of, of France. Uh, this is a two-part operation. First is to the conservation of the painting. Uh, the painting has been cleaned around 1959. It's, it's developed. It's been an area uh, where there's been a lot of environmental dirt. I did some testing down here. I pulled up a lot of dirt off the, uh, the surface. So the paint will be popped out. It will be cleaned. And uh, also, uh, someone has in-painted, or some people term it over-painted, but the real correct word is in-painted, hiding. And I'm seeing specks of actually, which would have been gold, but brass in his buttons. And somebody has in-painted over that sometimes. So that's going to be put back on. Uh, but I think uh, for this piece of French patrimony, that's the least of our worries. Our main concern here is the frame. The frame is dating, or the, the whole portrait and frame, which was conceived together, is the first quarter of the 18th century, uh, when, again, he was painted at the age of approximately 21. So the frame is warped. This entire oval frame is warped. Um, not so much a problem. We can straighten that back up a little bit. When we turn it around, we're going to see. Uh, what's happened in 1959, the frame was, or the painting surface was actually cleaned. A new stretcher system was put on. Um, and uh, I'll show, show you the details of that in a moment. Uh, so back to the frame. So the frame, what's happened is it's actually cracked. And this is just, this is just age. You know, we have a couple major cracks. Me just touching this, the crack opens up here, 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 and up here. These are major areas of fault. So the whole frame is actually going to come apart. Up and beyond that, it's not been treated quite so well. Uh, some of the issues hot here. Some of these, these were set in chunks. The frame was put together, it was carved oval. All this was carved. Then these components were padded and glued on in wood. And I can see here that this one, this one, this one has been missing. And they, they've, uh, they've cast them in what is called English paste. So they could try to get by by the easy way, the cheap way put this frame back together. So we're going to relieve and get rid of the cast components. And I'm going to carve new components to put on here so all these applied appliques are in wood. Um, and they're all out of oak, which is traditional for a French frame. Um, up and beyond that, uh, solving the major cracks and separations, taking the frame apart, and we will go through that as this process moves on, replacing these. Some of the actual pieces have uh, some leafage and vineage and parts of the flowers that are broken off. I will be re-gluing parts and components on, re-sculpting that, and re carving that. Okay? And uh, then we're going to go for cleaning. We're going to clean this whole thing. We're going to clean the frame. Uh, this frame has remnants down here all throughout the upper, upper level of the ornamentation of the gold paint. All has to come off. This was you know, not so unfortunate because I'm seeing through here to the gesso, I'm through, seeing through to the red bowl layer of clay. And as we've talked before, um, you can tell the country of origin by the color of red or yellow oak or bowl clay. Um, so you can tell, so this is definitely French. So if you had someone trying to sell you this as Italian, it's not Italian. So if you really knew what you're talking about, and that's a good thing. So. So we're going we're gonna to get down, get the whole frame in preparation for gilding. So this frame is going to come out bright. It's going to have great contrast between burnished areas and recessed areas. So that's the objective here. So let's spin, uh, let's spin Louis the Fifteenth, and let's just the dolphin and uh, the Rigel. Let's take a look at the back and let's see uh, what they've done in 1959. So in '59 in France, they've done a wonderful job at creating a new stretcher system. Um, the initial stretcher system, as, as I'm aware on these paintings, at times doesn't have a cross piece, and it just has a, you know, just has the oval inset piece. This is a wonderful cross piece, and these wedges, these wedges are put in to tighten the frame. So every couple of years, you want to look at your frames if you have this type of system, and just with a simple tap of the hammer, you can continually tighten this up because remember, this canvas is under tremendous amount of tension on this frame, pulling it. In pulling it and pulling it, just like strings on, a, on an ancient piano. So at times you want to relax them so the superstructure can have the time to, to get its gravitas back. So um, we're going to pull this out in, in just a few minutes, pull the frame out, take a 
a bit of a closer look up front and personal close and uh, take a closer look at the back of the frame. So, uh, so Louis in, in the conservation studio for just a bit of a stay. Um, probably it's going to take start to finish maybe about six weeks to do the job properly. Uh, it's going to be 23 karat gold around, all handmade gesso, and I have to make the bowl, uh, bowl clay up for the process. So uh, let's move on to the next step of uh, removing the painting. Okay, so we're continuing uh, examination on the flat surface of, uh, of our painting first on. And uh, I have some really good raking light here, and I can again see where there's been some uh, in painting on all the buttons. I can, I can see a very faint uh, gold in there, so I'm, I'm assuming there was a gold powder and some very uh, bad processes of hiding it. Uh, having a little bit of an issue here. As I'm surfacing here, I'm, I'm detecting a, a little bit of gold, but also some gold paint. So someone has really bastardized this. And, and as we talked before, these were carved wood segments placed on this initial frame. Okay? Um, a lot of them are lost petals of flowers, which I'm going to replace. There's loss here, here, here. Um, these are petals. There's loss. These are very old losses. And someone's come back and actually put some kind of gold or paint over to hide the losses. So we're going to try and take this back as far as we can to what is original. And again, some of these, um, this one here, and we have one here that's been recast, and it's called English Paste. It's going to be a, just a variation of uh, gesso. So they cast it. They're taking it an easy way out. They wanted to create this and plop them on without. Maybe they didn't have the skill to do any hand carving. So these guys will be replaced popped off. And some of these have come off and they've been re-glued loose, or a, a skew rather, like this one is too much this way. Okay, so it's got to be popped off, clean, and put back in more of a straight line. Uh, so that's what's going on here. We have some original gilding here in this gutter coming around. Um, what we're seeing here in the red is, is a bit of mold. That's the red mold from cleaning. You can see a little bit of gesso. So the base gesso still has a really good light. And remember, when we gesso this, we're going to talk about this, uh, the process in a bit again, how to do this. We're going to keep as much of original gesso as we can as possible. <laughs> when you put gesso on a new frame, a restoration area, you can't fill up all these wonderful original carving spaces. Otherwise, they have to be carved out. So in French, it's called reparu or recutting. So we have to recut the gesso to bring back the detail that was first put in by the wood. So what I'm going to do next is flip this over, and we're going to pop the painting out very gingerly. So here's our new 1950 stretcher system put in. 
some very bad ways of holding this in by some wire nails, which I don't recommend. We're going to use the period nails to hold this in next time. some issues here also on the painting. We're seeing, we're seeing uh, they apply a paper around here that tends to protect the canvas from fraying, and we're seeing we're having some degradation. Stop. Can you pick up from um, when you when you first pulled it up? Want to put it back in? Yeah, well not, just, just from, from the moment that you were, yeah, what happened was um, it wasn't ready for you to pick it up because it doesn't fit in the frame okay. when you pick it up, so I want to Get the whole thing in the frame. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so let's let's take a look at the uh, let's take a look at the painting here. Uh, you see the paint line coming around, being hidden in the rabbit of the original frame. frame. Cut. You're going to have to tip it a little bit forward because this for some reason the, right the glare is uh, you yeah. can't see the painting. Right there. Yeah. So we could re repeat that part you just did. Go ahead. Okay, so let's 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 uh, let's pull the painting out. The stretcher. Okay, so uh, you can see our paint line coming around. It was hidden in the rabbit, and uh, you know, I can see more now. Some of the, the, the surface, a little bit of surface degradation. Some of the failure of the varnish has been put on, and we'll, again, we'll address that later. And traditionally, you would you pull the canvas over. And Let's talk about the base frame here, the gilt frame. 
So uh, we can see that we're, we're comprised of four basic pieces of timber, and this is French oak as traditional in France or done in France. Um, but you can see here that, you know, was this a mistake? I mean, it appears to be how it was made. They actually, uh, but it's not. I mean, it may appear to some to say, oh, is, is, there, a, is there a triangle in set in here? Is there a triangle here? No, this is an original piece. This is a very weak structure. As this piece of timber turns around, this cross grain or long grain structure becomes very weak and, and all the expansion and contraction. So it started here and it started here and here. So these are not added pieces. These are original pieces and it's just not a strong point in the frame. And you know, when you have a frame dating back to the first quarter of the 18th century, this is what you're going to expect. But nevertheless, all these pieces are going to come apart. Um, you know, we'll continue on. I'm going to show you that these pieces of the frame and how we're going to rebuild. Once we get inside here, you can see that they put wooden pegs in to hold this together, the tenon, but again, the woodwork. So we need to see the, the amount of degradation here. We may have it here actually too. So let's flip over. Okay, so uh, flip, flipping the frame over here, uh, this is where these triangular, triangular areas here were. You don't see much of them here. We don't want to see them telegraphing through, and these lines are part of that triangle right here and here, um, here, over to here. So the long grain is breaking, and that's what we want to, uh, to address with the high growth. So that is item number one. So, uh, you know, our next we're going to be taking the frame apart. To do so, going to have to remove some of the ornament, such as down here. We have this piece of ornament that actually bridges over the crack down here. So these are going to have to be popped off very sympathetically with heat, um, prying just a little bit, and, uh, and hence we'll have this frame essentially into four pieces. At that point, we're going to deal with the triangular pieces, pulling those out, re-gluing, re-adhering those, and then putting the frame back together, and then going through a cleaning. So, uh, Next time we'll pick out, we'll, we'll have, a, uh, have the objects, the, the components on the table here, and uh, ready to show everyone how this is going to go back together. Okay, moving on, before we disassemble the, uh, the Louis the 15th frame, Richard's frame, uh, I want to explain some things I've done, explain the tools and, and some uh, things I've created with gilding as far as framing. So, our episode of framing and gilding is all going to come together. And uh, so let me just give you a little bit of background. So I'm certified as a uh, Italian gilder in Venice, Venice, Italy, and uh, in Paris, in France. And uh, this was a, a class project in Venice. Um, had to carve this. This is carved in, a, in lime wood and then gilt and, uh, with a patina put on it. So uh, nevertheless, quite the challenging. There was a lot. Talk about high relief. A tremendous amount of material was removed here to uh, produce this, and uh, this was done a number of years ago now, about 17 years ago, and it's uh, got some kind of green patina going on here. But these have been handled and used in demonstrations, and they've been thrown around and cracked, and various things have happened to these uh, some of these objects. So, uh, a simple shelf, as we call it, a simple Italian shelf, a Venetian shelf. Okay. So let's move on. Uh, here's just a, here's just a wall ornament. And uh, what I'm showing you here is what I, what I want to get the effect of, just the bold clay, the red clay, um, what it looks like. And, and again, these were used as samples and teachings aids when I've, I've taught about 30 different classes in gilding. And, you know, students will come up and put some gilding liqueur and, you know, slap a piece of gold on and things like that. So I have a whole series of these. So there's no rhyme or reason for, uh, you know, what these look like, other than I did the initial sculpting on this and the laying of the uh, board, the clay on it. Uh, <clears throat> this is a class project. Uh, class project in, uh, when I was apprentice in Paris for two years. So first of all, let's, let's, let's flip this over. Let's take a look at the back like we did on our Louis XV frame. Uh, this frame, you know it's a French frame 
when it has sliding tapered dovetails in the corner. So if someone was trying to sell you a frame and they said it was Italian, English, or American, don't know what they're talking about. But in general, this will hold these corners like nothing and they'll never come apart. Okay, let's take a look. So this was a year project off and on, uh, you know, slow pace is a class project. So I had to build, I had to build the frame, um, then I had to sculpt the frame, and then come back and gesso it, recut it, and apply the yellow ball, and the yellow ball again, the okra, goes down into the deep recesses. So in the process of gilding, as you can imagine, we have a lot of relief going on here, um, even some of the cross hatching and very minute cross hatching down in these low areas, you miss gilding. So if you have a yellow okra bowl, then you don't notice the holiday or the mist that's there. And then just on the high, the high uh, levels of carving, I put a red bowl or red clay, and that will transpose through the thin piece of gold, and, and it creates uh, another contrast with the, the matte areas. So these high areas with the red, not only is it transmitting through the gold, changing the color of the gold, but they're also going to be burnished. So they're going to be a high polish, and then the recesses will be a matte. So we're creating a contrast here. And uh, and then the gutter is just the gutter is just in the red hole around here. And some Louis the Thirteenth, uh, Louis the Fourteenth frames would have applied sand in the gutter to even create a more matte finish to diffuse the light. So um, we're going to move to uh, another frame. And again. This was a class project. Uh, this was a three-week project for students to create the frame and gild the frame. But I had some overzealous students that somebody just wants to apply putting gold on. But you can see some of the uh, the high relief here. This is, you know, this bridging is very fragile. Um, again, let's take a look at the back. Sliding tapered dovetails in the French style. And uh, here's where the gold uh, is laid down properly. It's very beautiful, and this is all burnished, high burnished, just lovely. And uh, students were experimenting with other powders and things like that. So, uh, and here is a project uh, when in France, when in Paris. Um, the objective was was to create molds. So when you're a gilder, you may at some times, particularly when you're copying or restoring English frames replace something. So all these were found on doorways of Paris. I mean, I'm sure everyone's seen some posters say the doorway of Judith, the doorways of Philadelphia. But these were all taken off of doorways around Paris. You know, Louis the Sun King and the shell and various shells and things like that and these ropings. So not only did I have to create the, uh, the mold, I had to cast and I had to put different gilds. So there's different, particularly the top row, there's different styles of gilding in that Tina is different. So we have bright gilding here with burnished high spots, matte low relief spots. We have an over patent spots in here showing some, some bowl coming through from wearing it a bit. And this is all needed to, to tie in to the restoration project when you're, you're, you're restoring a missing piece of gold on a frame or gilded object. Um, this is smoked. These two are smoked. Louis is smoked and this object smoked. Literally, literally creating a fire on the bench holding your object over and catching a lot of the black, black carbon to emulate what was found from fireplaces and a lot of candlelight. Because remember, if this was a frame, you may have candle sconces on either side and you're getting a lot of soot coming up all the time. So, so this was a class project, uh, a good thing to develop an eye for patina and uh, mold making in France. And lastly, I'm gonna show everyone, as far as the, uh, the frames go here, so this is a, a very quick class, a 30-hour class for students, which I've given many times. So it shows the complete process. We took some old wood, we make a frame, sliding the dovetails in the French style. You mix up your gesso here, and this is a stippling. The gesso gets stippled on the hot gesso. This is about 15 coats. And then what happens is we took shark skin, as they did, and stingray skin, as they did in the period and we smooth this down, and this is as smooth as a, the hardest metal you'd ever want to touch. It's absolutely beautiful. And then the application of the bowl, which isn't traditional here, because the bowl would want to be in recesses, 
So possibly actually the little the little fillets here, the little gutters, that's the, the, the red bowl, but just showing students how to apply it so they know. And then in here, we did two different things. In the middle, we, we were gonna apply the bead. So we took this quarter round in the wood and actually halfway down carved it with a carving chisel to create the beaded effect. I had the students dig this part out with a, with a gouge and they dug it out and they actually made small beads. They made a mold of casting and laid a string in a mold and they cast and plastered and they lifted this up and they had beads and they implanted the beads in the carve out. So there's two different methodologies of how to get this beading effect in this quarter round. So a good exercise and that continued here. But in the same token, the gold was laid here. The base of the patina with gelatin is, is put on the second half here. And then the patina is laid using various paint pigments and smoke uh, and the termination on this side. So, and remember, a lot of, when this frame was up against the wall, a lot of the major patinization that was occurring was on the bottom part of the frame. The environmental effects floating in the air, landing, landing, landing year after year. And you know, even somebody who's cleaning the frame, some of the cleaning fluid or the water, the detergent may get ended up here. And it even tracks more dirt or move the dirt around. So you would always find much more dirt here. So, um, so let me uh, let me move these items around, and uh, we're going to pick up with uh, recutting in just a moment. And it's uh, got some kind of green patina going on here, but these have been handled and used in demonstrations, and they've been thrown around and cracked, and various things have happened to these uh, some of these objects. So, uh, a simple shelf, as we call it, a simple Italian shelf. So let's move on. Uh, here's just a, here's just a wall ornament, and uh, what I'm showing you here is what I, what I want to get the effect of just the bold clay, the red clay, um, what it looks like. And, and again, these were used as samples and teaching aids when I I taught about 30 different classes in gilding, and you know students will come up and put some gilding liqueur and you know slap a piece of gold on and things like that. So I have a whole series of these. So there's no rhyme or reason for. Uh, you know, what these look like, other than I did the initial sculpting on this and the laying of the uh, board, the clay on it. Uh, <clears throat> this is a class project, a uh, class project in, uh, when I was an apprentice in Paris for two years. So, first of all, let's, let's, let's look this over. Let's take a look at the back, like we did on our Louis XV frame. Uh, this frame, you know it's a French frame when it has sliding tapered dovetails so if someone was trying to sell you a frame and they said it was Italian, English, or American, don't know what they're talking about. But in general, this will hold these corners like nothing and they'll never come apart. Okay, let's take a look. So this was a year project off and on, uh, you know, slow pace as a class project. So I had to build, I had to build the frame, um, then I had to sculpt the frame, and then come back and gesso it, recut it, and apply the yellow bowl and the yellow ball again, the okra, goes down into the deep recesses. So in the process of gilding, as you can imagine, we have a lot of relief going on here. Um, even some of the cross hatching and very new cross hatching down in these low areas. You miss gilding. So if you have a yellow okra bowl, then you don't notice the holiday or the mist that's there. And then just on the high, the high uh, levels of carving, I put the red bowl or red clay and that will transpose through the thin piece of gold and, and it creates uh, another contrast with the, the mat areas. So these high areas with the red, not only is it transmitting through the gold, changing the color of the gold, but they're also going to be burnished. So they're going to be a high polish and then the recesses will be a matte. So we're creating a contrast here. And, uh, and then the gutter is just, the gutter is just in the red bowl around here. And some of Louis the 13th, uh, Louis the 14th frames, would have applied sand in the gutter to even create a more matte finish to diffuse the light. So um, we're going to move to uh, another frame. And again, uh, this was a class project. Uh, this was a three-week project for students to create the frame and gild the frame. But I had some overzealous students that someone just wants to apply putting gold on. But you can see some of the uh, the high relief here, this is, 
you know, this bridging is very fragile. Um, again, let's take a look at the back. Sliding tapered dovetails in the French style. And uh, here's where the gold uh, is laid down properly. It's very beautiful, and this is all burnished, a high burnish, just lovely. And uh, students were experimenting with other powders and things like that, so. Uh... Here's a project uh, when in France, when in Paris. Um, the objective was, was to create molds. So when you're a gilder, you may at some times, particularly when you're copying or restoring English frames, to replace something. So all of these were found on doorways of Paris. I mean, I'm sure everyone's seen some posters say the doorway of Judith, the doorways of Philadelphia. But these were all taken off of doorways around Paris. You know, Louis the Sun King and the shell and various shells and things like that and these ropings. So not only did I have to create the, uh, the mold, I had to cast and I had to put different gilds. So there's different, particularly the top row, there's different styles of gilding in that the patina is different. So we have bright gilding here with burnished high spots, matte low relief spots. We have an over patinized possibly here, showing some, some bowl coming through from wearing a bit. And this is all needed to, to tie in to the restoration project when you, you're, you're restoring a missing piece of gold on a frame or gilt object. Um, this is smoked. These two are smoked. Louis is smoked, and this object is smoked. Literally, literally creating a fire on the bench, holding your object over and catching a lot of the black, black carbon to emulate what was found from fireplaces and a lot of candlelight. Because remember, if this was a frame, you may have candle sconces on either side, and you're getting a lot of soot coming up all the time. So, so this was a class project, um, a good thing to develop an eye for patina and uh, mold making while in France. And lastly, I'm going to show everyone as far as the, uh, the frames go here. So this is a, a very quick class, a 30-hour class for students, which I've given many times. So it shows the complete process. We took some old wood, we make a frame, sliding dovetails in the French style. You mix up your gesso here, and this is a stippling. The gesso gets stippled on the hot gesso. This is about 15 coats, and then what happens is we took shark skin as they did and stingray skin as they did it in the period, and we smoothed this down, and this is as smooth as a, a hardest metal you'd ever want to touch. It's absolutely beautiful. And then the application of the bowl, which isn't traditional here because the bowl would want to be in recesses, so possibly actually the little, the little fillets here, the little gutters, that's the, then the red bowl, but just showing students how to apply it so they know. And then in here, we did two different things. In the middle, we, we were gonna apply the bead. So we took this quarter round in the wood and actually halfway down carved it with a carving chisel to create the beaded effect. I had the students dig this part out with a, with a gouge and they dug it out and they actually made small beads. They made a mold of casting and laid a string in a mold and they cast in plaster, and they lifted this up and they had beads, and they implanted the beads in the carve out. So there's two different methodologies of how to get this beading effect in this quarter round. So a good exercise, and that continued here. But in the same token, the gold was laid here. The base of a patina with gelatin is, is put on the second half here, and then the patina is laid using various paint pigments and smoke uh, and the termination on this side. So. And remember, a lot of, when this frame was up against the wall, a lot of the major patinization that was occurring was in the bottom part of the frame. The environmental effects floating in the air, landing, 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 year after year. And, you know, even somebody who's cleaning the frame, some of the cleaning fluid or the water, the detergent may get ended up here. And it even tracked more dirt or moved the dirt around. So you would always find much more dirt here. So, um, so, let me, uh, let me move these items around and uh, we're going to pick up with uh, recutting in just a moment. Is this stuff okay here? Okay, so continuing on here, uh, I have a, a, a gesso pound. Uh, it has 21 coats of gesso. And this is a great thing when I teach, uh, try to get for, for two purposes. 
you get the students to prepare, and here's the, you can see the end of the board, there's 21 coats applied here. And after every couple coats, after every night, the next day they have to smooth this down. And this is like metal, it's so smooth. So it serves the students learning how to properly coat their, their gilded surface with the gesso, how to smooth it down. Secondly, they draw their, their, their proposed carving. So this is all about gesso recutting, using the recutting, the French recutting tools. So first we need to draw our outline. It's, this is a basket with flowers, leaves, etc. I'm going to put this aside and bring this one up. So this is the same basket that I've taken some carving tools and uh, you know started to carve the basket to give the illusion of, of woven uh, the woven material. Here's a flower showing the envelop petal overlapping each other, um, and just some basic outlining first of the leaves. So this is really 101, but it's a great thing that students can take home with them after the class and finish this. And then it gives them an, an essence to look back on what they need to do for the next one. So let's move to one more panel. And this was my practice panel when I was in France as an apprentice. And uh, so I did the same thing in 21 coats, smoothed it out super smooth. That's me, Gregoire, en Francais. And these are all different tool marks by different tools. And I will show you this tool in a minute. But, uh, and this is a carving tool for cutting plaster again. So it's carved on the pull, not the push. It's a pulling motion, a pulling, and, a, and I'll show you that motion in just a bit. Even from these little floral pulls, it's essential. Creating lines, creating cross hatchings like on our Louis XIV and Louis XV frames. A broader cross hatching and different things like that. So this is a great practice board. I had about 10 of these over the course of two years. And, uh, it's essential uh, as it is to, to apply gesso, to smooth it down, to know how to do the recutting, because what we don't want to do is lose all the great detail of the frame carver. So, and uh, so next we're going to move on. I'm going to show everyone some tools. Okay, so uh, continuing on, now we're going to we're going to finish up this uh, this little segment of our, uh, of our tutorial here on tools. So this is a tool roll that I typically carry around. I'm just going to randomly pick out a few. We call these mops, and uh, this is going to be a mop for using gesso. So you're going to you're going to heat the gesso up with rabbit skin glue, and and you're going to dip it, and you're going to stipple down your down your frame like this right here. This this rough surface. So you get in your hot gesso, and you stipple down, you stipple down, and you let it dry. And you want you want a double tight bond. You don't want it to totally dry. You want it to be a little bit wet. So you wait about 20 minutes. You go back into your uh, your double boiler and you dip in and you stipple again and you put more gesso down. So that's the use of this tool, this mop as we call it. Um, we just talked before about recutting tools, and uh, so these are sp specifically made in France and the world by the buys these England Germany for recutting. So these are carving tools for plaster, uh, plaster powers or gesso. And again, I'm just going to make a motion here, and it's going to be, I, I grip it with the index finger out as my finger was part of the tool, and I'm going to do a, a flick like this. I'm flicking um, and cutting, and I may outline something with this actually, like that flower basket we just had, but I'm going to, I'm going to do flicks and pulls. Different intensity is going to go lower, if I pull it out, out, of the, out of the surface of the ground or the gesso, it's going to do a lighter line. So there's all types of recarving or cutting tools in France. So they're, they're an essential part of the total uh, restoration gilders repertoire. Um, these, uh, another one I want to show you, these are very, uh, very light duty and you know, sometimes these are made out of hair of uh, various animals. Um, but this is for tamping down the gold. So, if, if I just had applied the gold leaf to here, and it was very fragile yet, and I would just, they're very soft, almost like a makeup brush, and I want to tamp this down, okay? And, you know, by the way, this is a, a panel I did in a class we offered to do, uh, you know, the figurines and the uh, chinoiserie style in France. So, so I, I taught the students in the first week we carved, the second week we gilded and we colored in, you know, the red with rabbit skin glue and pigments, and then the gold leaf, and then kind of a, a muddy background of sand and dirt down here. So that's what we do with this type of, uh, of this type of brush. And uh, I think we're good with the brushes. Uh, the, the main focus here is on the, uh, the gilder's cushion. 
we, we spoke about in the, ent in the entree. Um, it has a number of handholds here in the bottom. You can hold it and you can hold your, your gilder's knife. This is a very sharp knife. Um, often, uh, you know, they can be had at just one or few places here in the States, but it's, it's too uh, sharpened on two sides. You want to be so careful with this. It's an expensive knife. It's about $100 for the knife. But when I say careful, you don't want to nick it. Because if you create a nick in this and you're cutting your gold, you'll tear your gold instead of having a clean cut. So uh, this is the Gilder's cushion. It's been sitting uh, sitting on the bench for a while. This is out of parchment. So this is, this is to keep the air out. So typically, this is a book of gold, 25, 25 leaves. But it's been all used up. And you can see the rouge paper that has a little bit of powder here so the gold doesn't stick. What I do is I empty the entire book of gold into the cushion. This is fine lambskin. And you want to keep this clean. You don't want to get anything on this. So just imagine you have 25 leaves here and you maneuver your gold in the back. And this keeps any air from blowing in. What a no-no when you're an apprentice in a gilder studio, whether it's an apprentice in Venice, Italy or in Paris, if you were to open the door without adequately addressing yourself on the outside, and you had five or six gilders and you blew all the gold, you'll be intentionally led to the door and never return again. So you have to be aware when you enter the studio that what's going on in the studio, how you come in, how you enter. So, so that's what this is for. Here is the, uh, the gilder's tip. This is out of French squirrel hair, a certain type of species. It stays, the hair stay very erect like that. And this is for actually picking up the, uh, picking up the piece of gold and setting it down on the object. And sometimes I put a type of animal grease on my forehead or my wrist. I'll hit the wrist, hit the forehead, and it'll give it a small charge. I'll pick the piece up and I'll lay it on the object. So these are rather expensive, around $100 for this. Sometimes we'll cut these down into one half inch, one inch, whatever size we really need to do the job we're doing. Very essential. Um, but So we're not going to cut any gold today here because we don't want to waste it sheet of gold but when we get on to the actual Louis the 15th frame restoration we're going to get into that so I'm going to show you the gold so here we are with the gold um, the gold is, is hand beaten for 2,000 years as far back as we know um, this is in Florence Italy Firenze this is from Gustav Manetti uh, I prefer this it's a triple triple strength gold and uh, this is a 23 karat gold this right now is about $100 for this little packet. The frame we're dealing with is going to take about $2,000 just in gold. Um, 23 carats is a double, D, double X. And you're going to see how fragile that gold leaf is. That's 23 carats. It's pure gold. And it's hammered so that this is one-eighth the thickness of a human hair. That's how thin that is. And I can flick it up a little bit, show everybody. and I will show you how to maneuver gold. One of the most important things is, but I, I like the Minetti gold. I can buy French gold, German gold, Minetti gold, or some, uh, some gold is being actually produced in England, but this is still hammered by hand. And the, the Japanese also produce gold, but they're rolling it, they're pressing it with high, high, uh, high weight rollers. I don't prefer that, so are the Germans. To me, it's a way of cheating. If, if the, the gold comes out too uniform, this, you see the hammering marks, at least I do in this gold surface, so it's very important. So more gold is on, on the way for this project. And again, I would take this booklet and dump all 25 sheets into the gilder's cushion at one time. And I'd put them all to the back, and I'd literally pull one out with my knife here, blow on it, flatten it out, and I will show you how to do this at, at, at later in the project. Um, in addition, we talked about patentization. The first type of patentization is using a gelatin. A gelatin is going to be a covering of the gold when all your gilding is done. And then on top of the gelatin, we are going to, this will melt in water, in, in uh, boiling water, not boiling water, but a lukewarm water, it's going to melt, and it'll be applied with one of our, our gilder's mops. And your patentization to do a restoration or if you're doing a new frame, this is the basis of it. So essential is gelatin. I'm only showing you this, and this is, uh, Kohler makes a system for uh, bowl clay and uh, called obviously a German company, and here's uh, here's a red and an okra. Uh, I don't use this. I show the students if they don't want to go through the rigors of straining and rehydrating clay to make theirs from scratch, then they can cheat a little bit. Unfortunately, this is acrylic. It doesn't sand well. 
But we, we do traditional uh, traditional plays in rabbit skin glue. They sand very well. And uh, so Colmer is a way uh, kind of to cheat, but you know, you, you can't do everything yourself sometimes when you're home, the student can, so until they get to a certain level, so it's very important. And in here we have, you know, some pieces of gold that have fallen to the floor, and, and we don't want to leave anything on the floor. I mean, it's too much money involved here in the gold, so pick it up and throw it in a container. It's, it's bright and airy, so. Um, so uh, next we're going to move on to the disassemblage of the frame, the Louis XV frame, and show you how to put that back together and clean the, uh, the mating surfaces. So the varnish is just drying on the, the Rijon Louis the Fifteenth here. So I, I've uh, yesterday I finished up the uh, the, uh, the surface, new surface varnish for the painting. Um, the uh, as far as painting goes and, and the, the cleaning process, the painting was uh, you know moderately dirty, not that bad. But what has really come to light is uh, a lot of Louis's makeup on his nose and his cheeks, and he has actually has lipstick on for the for the painting so that came and a lot of crack allure up here so that's been taken care of you couldn't see his locks before now they're they're, they're flowing quite nicely also the ascot um, you're seeing the artist brush strokes here and the curly cues and things like that up here and going down his breast very nice and what was hidden totally was this beautiful blue in his shirt um, also the reds the interior lining which is a wool lining on his coat and uh, also these gilt areas for the buttons were totally masked over. So uh, used three different uh, solvents going from the mundane, uh, a little bit of water with a little bit of detergent to have something a little more potent, a little more potent, but be very careful. And then uh, I came over with a Windsor Newton satin varnish. And uh, when you do this, take full strokes and first get yourself a very good brush. Uh, I have a brush here by a Gambar, it's a $65 brush, good investment, and take entire strokes and start in like an airplane landing and land on the painting and straight off the side. And then overlap that other stroke when you come back so you, you, you didn't miss the initial landing point. So back and forth very slowly. You want to get a very thick coat of varnish on here. It's going to look extre extremely wet. Um, we're putting satin, so don't be alarmed. It's going to take about five, six hours for this to dry. So, uh, and when it does, you come come back the next morning, and you'll be very happy. So, I think the museum will be very happy with the quality. This is about twenty-five percent of the uh, of the quote frame and painting of restoration, just the painting. And uh, next, we'll spend the next seventy-five percent of our time working on the uh, the period frame, uh, dating from the uh, first part of the eighteenth century. Okay, we've uh, just finished up uh, the last coat of varnish, uh, the, the only coat of varnish on Louis, uh, Louis the Fifteenth, the Regent, the, the Restoration, which would, entails this painting. This is a period painting from the early 18th century. Again, um, it's the cleaning. I used three different types of solvents. Um, being very sympathetic in the beginning, get a little more aggressive toward the end. Um, so I was able to pull a lot of the color out of Louis's face. It was a lot of black, a ton of dirt, a ton of smoke, and and a uh, ton of uh, ton of oils from probably fires that were around in, in the room. And now I can see his uh, I can see his makeup on. I can see his lipstick. He actually has lipstick for this uh, sitting, and uh, the locks of his hair couldn't couldn't make it out before. It's just almost jet black. So now that's really popping. As we move down. Another thing that's come to light is the ascot. A lot of the artist strokes and curly cues in the ascot here around his neck and then down his breast. Um, the blues were totally muted out. So the blues are jumping now. Um, the red velvet or the red, I'm sorry, the red wool on the inside of his coat. And also some of the gilt that was put on the buttons is, is again there. It was totally non-existent. So it's back. And uh, in his cleaning process stopped. I put one coat of Windsor Newton satin varnish on and uh, shake up the container very well. If anybody out there has to try this, all of the flattening agent settles to the bottom. And if you don't do anything, but buy yourself a really good brush, uh, a Gambar I'm using here, a $65 brush. It's, it's a medium of the road, but you know, if you're doing this, trying to do something at home or you're learning, this is an expensive brush. What we want to do is take full length strokes. We're going to land like an airplane in brush loaded and straight off the edge and then come back, come in a little bit and overlap and then 
finish the painting where you, you didn't land here as the airplane. So everything gets overlapped. Falling stroke, light touch, heavy load on the brush, and then it's going to be very glossy. And then once it dries, in about six hours, this is what you get because we want to set. And uh, I think it worked out very well. I mean, the museum has seen pictures of this. They're very happy with it. And uh, they can't wait to see our progress on the frame. This is about 25% of the episode in the historic preservationists uh, doing the painting, restoration. Now we're going to move on and uh, get back on track on the frame, the period frame that surrounds Louis XV, the Rigel of, of France. So as, as, as I just stated, we, we've done the frame in, in the multitude of stages, not traditionally, but there's a series of steps, and we're going we're to go, we're going to go clockwise here, and I'm going to explain everything in, uh, about the process of water gilding and the condition of the frame. Okay, so the first thing is, I just saw this about 15 coats of gesso. So between each couple of coats before it's dried, I would come in with 1500 grit paper and I'd sand it very lightly. And I try to get in all the nooks and crannies because when I put the bold clay on this, it's gonna be reminiscent of what's underneath. So the entire frame, all this floor ornamentation, the leaves have all been sanded with 1500 grit to make this gesso extraordinarily smooth because in the end, we're trying to make this frame, the process of water gilding, is to make this look like it's a piece of metal, a piece of gold. And you can see uh, see this rocking. This is what I was referring to before, this little bit of rocking. That's the, uh, the issue with the frame drying out naturally. So I want to show what it looked like and what it would feel like to have gesso here, uh, pre-putting the, the bowl clay on. And so I just did, this is called a gutter, right next to the gutter. I didn't get any of the gutter. Um, and uh, so we'll, we'll talk a bit more about the, the, the new bowl clay in a minute. But let's move on, let's move on here. And let's take a look at this area here. Um, what you're seeing is original, original bowl clay from the first quarter of the 18th century. That's what's left. You can see where it's carved, how it's carved, uh, the, the ornamentation, the design that's still left. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to apply some gesso, which I have in the double boiler here, you know, just a little bit of gesso. And we're actually, I normally put this on with a stippling effect, so I'm going to stipple into the recesses or the relief. And I just put enough in here just to get me through this little segment. So I like stippling because when this, when this dries, um, and the next coat goes in, it forms a nice bond with a stipple. And then eventually I will come back and I will actually sand this down. And the last couple coats are going to be brushed on as opposed to stippled. But I'm looking for a nice lock and key bond here as I'm putting my fresh gesso over the old bowl clay and any other spots in the, uh, in the frame that are down to bare wood. And we're not here to take all the old gesso off or the old bowl clay. Uh, if it's adhered well enough, then we leave it there. And uh, a piece may be coming loose. We may try to get some, sneak some glue underneath or use a rabbit skin glue to keep it adhered. So. And, uh, and as soon as this dries, you know, 15 minutes, it starts to tack up. I'm going to come back and start putting another, uh, another coat on. So if you come back to the same beginning, and I have a little bit of an overlap here. I see some micro cracks in the first uh, 15 coats right here. So I would end up brushing this out right here. Brushing this amount out. So uh, this is going to have to dry for 15 minutes. I can come back and do this again. And right now that's finished. Now um, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and we're going to address this crack. We've had a series of cracks. I'm just going to show you how I address the crack. But uh, let me go for my glue pot and we'll pick this up in just a moment. Okay, so continuing on, uh, we had about seven cracks, seven major cracks. I'm just going to show you what I've, what I've done. And keep in mind, the mortise and tenons have already been rebuilt and re-glued internally in the frame. So here in my, uh, my double boiler here, I have some, uh, some high glue and I have some, uh, actually, I, I just mixed up a little bit of, uh, a little bit of sawdust in here. It's going to give a little bit of body. And, uh, you know, we're going to pour some of that into the groove and then maybe with a spatula if we need to. But we need to, we need this to work down into the groove and fill it up. 
and it's it's already uh, it, it's already meeting at the back, so they're not trying to recreate the wheel down there. And I, as you can see, it's built up. And I'm going to take the spatula in and try and work down into that groove a little bit more, so we get to the depth and start filling up at that point. So. We have some very strong hide wood here. This is not the rabbit skin wood that we're using. So it's, it's going to tack up in two ways. It's going to tack up in two ways. When it cools, the initial tack, and that's going to be really quick. And then the second tack is going to be what loses its moisture. So that's going to gain its maximum strength. This will have a lot of flexibility to it. Cracks this way, then we'll have to come back and fill it in. Just want to get it surfaced and maybe do some engraving to the end of the surface. This way, I keep a natural, uh, a natural material of the frame, which is the silicon. And so as you can see, it's, it's getting sticky right now. It's cool. So, so uh, we're going to move that back to our next operation in just a moment, and uh, we're moving around the frame here. So uh, let me regroup here and we'll pick up the next operation. So I, I, left this, uh, I left this segment in white, which is gessoed with about 11 coats. Every couple coats I'll give a light sanding. Um, if I raise any grain with the water, the gesso kind of knocks it back down. Then eventually I'll just be, the beginning coats I'll be stippling because they want to they grip to each other. My last few coats of gesso toward 9, 10, 11, I'll be using broad brush strokes over here. And in the end, I'm going to come back and sand this with about 1,500 grit paper and try not to go through and sand every little nook and cranny. We're not going to go over this now, but this has all been sanded. In the end, this is supposed to feel and look like it was solid gold, solid metal. That's what we're trying to achieve here. So we're going to move up here into an area which I've stippled one coat of gesso to. Pull it out of our double double boiler, and uh, you're going to see the stippling action. Sometimes I'll stipple it a little more aggressive than not, but I want to get down in all the nooks and crannies as I do this, right up to the gutter. This is the gutter here. I left that that's already bowled up in the clay, so this is warm, and I just made it up just so just for uh, just for a video demonstration here. So this will be uh, this will be number two, and I'll probably go with three coats here, and then. I will come back and let it dry for a bit and sand it, knock it down. Hopefully we'll be about to make some more gesso before the next run. So a good stippling action. You don't have to have a stipple brush, but just to get down all the relief because we want a good basis those first couple coats. And don't don't worry about overlapping if you're getting it onto the white or the yellow bowl rather, because we will take care of it. So I think we'll take a break. Let me regroup here. After I regroup, I'm gonna get my uh, my gap filling adhesive out to take care of this crack and to show you how we take care of those type of issues. So uh, fin finishing up our, our gilt frame, uh, just to reiterate that we've patinized with uh, various types of painting pigments diluted and, and again some we use smoke. We've come over that with a protective layer which will change or adjust or correct the sheen using a, a water-based gelatin. Um, the food grade or above can be used. And uh, so we have a sheen change, we have protection, and uh, that pretty much finishes our uh, restoration of the flange frame up. Um, so any old nails get rid of, and we're gonna replace it with new cut style nails in the back. And, and uh, I think we're ready to go. And remember our, our, our painting has been protected by uh, a premium varnish, uh, UV per, uh, inhibiting type varnish also, which is very very important. So, and uh, so here's our uh, here's the finished product right here. I think it's a, a very smart representation, and uh, and the client uh, is very happy with this. Thanks uh, for everyone for listening to and watching episode two.